Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Taryn Picard from Onset, and I will be your host today. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on tips for selecting and deploying indoor data loggers. I will be introducing you to your presenter, Max Kirkwood, in just a moment. And there's a lovely photo of me, your host. I am the Onset Sales Manager, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. So I'll give you a little overview here of Onset. We are a world leader in data loggers, founded back in 1981. Uh, we fluctuate with employees. We have about 140 right now, but during our busy season, because we do all of the manufacturing here in-house, we sometimes have several more people here to help us build the data loggers. Uh, we do have a global network of partners helping us to distribute our data loggers across the world. Uh, and our sole focus is on data logging and monitoring. So the webinar details are here. We should run for about 40 minutes. We will save some time for questions and answers at the end. Please don't worry if we don't have a chance to answer your specific question. I do want to assure you that we will have someone reach out to you after the webinar. Um, and that might be helpful for some of you who have very specific application questions. We want to be able to customize our response to best meet your needs. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so if you miss a portion of it, do not worry. We will send it out to you afterwards in a follow-up email. So here is our agenda today. We will take a nice overview of our indoor monitoring measurements, some common applications, and again, save some time for questions at the end. So without further ado, let me go right ahead and welcome Max. Max is one of our product application specialists here at Onset, and his expertise is in recommending Hobo data loggers for your building performance monitoring needs. Welcome, Max. Thank you, Taryn, for that uh, fantastic introduction. Um, we're really excited today to welcome everyone um, particularly some of our more experienced users in the building performance space. Um, while each of you has utilized some of our loggers in one capacity or another, the idea with today's presentation is really to take a deeper dive into using and deploying them. Right here, you can see a number of the indoor parameters that our hobos can monitor. While they are broken into three general categories here, we'll be breaking them out into application-specific buckets that make up the majority of our indoor usage. Um, the first of those will be energy consumption, then we'll dive into HVAC, before air quality, and finally lighting. Now before we dive into our first application, uh, let's start with a brief poll to gauge which of these categories your application falls into. We'll open this up for about a minute and uh, close once we get most of the participants to vote. All right, Max. Well, the poll has been launched. We're seeing right now uh, that about 50% of the attendees are in the energy auditing segment, and then right behind that would be mostly people doing um, some HVAC monitoring. So let me go ahead and close out the poll in just a moment here, and I'll share those results with everyone. Great. It's um, really nice to have a, a fairly diverse group, um, although we're mainly in the energy and HVAC buckets. Um, to start off, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, 
energy consumption. That's really going to be the initial application that we dive into. Um, you'll see here on this screen uh, that we, we're going to you know, identify some of the solutions that we have with standalone loggers, starting with the UX120-018. Um, that's Onset's plug load hobo. Uh, this easy to deploy logger, it measures and records power and energy consumption of 15 amp 120 volt plug loads. It's great for use on office equipment, um, vending machines and other devices. And it's incredibly accurate with 0.5% accuracy and resolution of one lot, one watt, excuse me. Um, it, it's an ideal choice for, for building audits specifically when you need that sort of granularity in um, which plug loads are using the most energy. The next logger, um, which will hit home for many of you, is the UX120006M with three CT sensors, uh, specifically for you know, approximating kilowatt hour usage. Um, using this system, um, you have a nice easy way to approximate usage in a system. Um, because this, this logger is a four channel logger uh, with multiple four to 20 milliamp inputs, it's quite versatile and you can use it in a variety of different um, applications. The final system that we're gonna mention just briefly is the UX9001 with a watt node. You can see that picture below, although the watt node is hidden within the panel. Um, this is a, a great solution for um, panel level monitoring. Just make sure that when you're, you're doing any panel level monitoring, you do have a licensed electrician install it. Um, as many of you may be aware, we do have other options, but these are kind of some of the mo more popular ones in this space. Um, the, the real advantages of these and all of the hobos that you'll be seeing today are that they're low cost, portable, easy to display, and they have LCD displays. Now, we're gonna focus a little bit on the plug load logger and take a look at some applications or, or an application story um, specifically related to it. Um, the plug load logger is, plug loads you know, are generally one of the fastest growing um, energy wasters, so to speak, in a space. Um, those, this logger, um, it, it can be deployed easily in a building. You can swap it between plug loads to be able to compare them on, it, on an ongoing basis. Um, while other types of power monitoring equipment are utilized to monitor at the sub panel or individual circuit level, this really gives you that granularity of a specific plug load. The specific application that we'll be talking about today um, is actually one that we did about 50 feet away from us right now over in the lobby of Onset. Um, we had a display case over there that nicely displays um, the evolution of our loggers over time. If you squint, you may actually be able to make out some of the different generations that you've seen over the years. Um, the issue that we had was that this display case has it's been there almost since the start of onset in this building um, So it was using halogen lamps um, And they would burn out pretty regularly and waste a lot of energy We installed one of the plug load loggers and monitored during the day that we switched the lamps to uh, new LED bulbs as you can see, um, there was a pretty dramatic drop off in the energy usage uh, on that day. Um, the, the line decreases sharply, um, you know, and having a graph like this from a plug load logger, it can really prove the point quickly to a client or customer um, who you're trying to really prove the efficacy of the changes that you make in their building. Now, the plug load itself um, will display four or five different parameters um, with probably the most pertinent one initially being watt hours. Um, when you plug it in, that initial display on the LCD will show cumulative watt hours up to a specific point. Um, this will remain cumulative um, until the logger is relaunched. When the data sets are presented in HoboWare, 
um, you can actually see that they're logged per interval rather than in a cumulative basis. Um, you can apply filters to the unit in order to try to get specific time periods and specific changes. Um, it's pretty versatile in general to be able to utilize the software. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, with all of our energy units, safety is the most important thing. If you're doing anything at a panel level, please do make sure to have a licensed electrician perform the installation. It's common to monitor power in 15 minute intervals. Um, that, that really will be the the uh, easiest way to, to match up the data that you're collecting with any utility meters um, or other devices that are already deployed in the field. Since most meters uh, will provide a variety of different power quality factors like amperage, voltage, and power factor, um, in addition to your kilowatt hours, it's it's always best to keep an eye on these when you're reviewing the data uh, post-deployment. Specifically, when one of these variables drops out or if there's any inconsistency, um, it can point towards you know, some other issues in the system that you're studying. It's always best to ensure that your deployment is uh, properly installed prior to leaving the site. Um, part of the reason is that uh, you don't want to get back and find out that it was installed incorrectly, and then the data over the past several months is is not going to be as useful. Um, in general, it's almost impossible to retroactively fix data from improperly installed equipment. Um, one good tip in a place that you know often drops out with these little problems is making sure that the current transformers are properly installed, facing the correct way um, according to their instruction manuals. So we have a little bit of a surprise for you guys, which is that we're only doing two of the three poll questions today. So this one you, you just get to look at and enjoy um, while we skip along to the next application. <laughs> the second application we're gonna talk about today is HVAC. Um, from a standalone logger perspective, uh, the, the pr probably the main logger that's in use is going to end up being um, the UX 12006N that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Unlike the initial application, um, HVAC professionals tend to like to utilize some differentiated sensors when they're using these, whether that be having four temperature sensors that can kind of give a temperature profile of a system as a whole, um, or integrating both current and temperature to get a picture of the power usage in addition to uh, the movement of temperature throughout the system. Uh, the next option that we have here is the U12013. That's a temp and RH logger with two analog sensors. Um, the U12013 is small in size, so it's fairly easy to deploy in a duct or vent. Um, in addition to that, the ability to input analog sensors, it gives you that added value um, that you, you maybe perhaps uh, like out of the UX 120006M, including current sensors or additional temperature probes. Um, the final solution that we'll talk about today in the HVAC realm is going to be the RX3000, and we're approximating a cost here with four of our smart sensors or analog sensors. Um, the RX3000 is kind of the main remote monitoring option that Onset offers. It can be deployed both indoors and outdoors. It's fully weatherproofed and has a whole suite of both environmental and performance monitors, sensors. The specific application that we'll talk about is trying to get a temperature profile out of a system. You'll see here that we have deployed one of the UX 120006Ms with a variety of temperature probes on it. Um, they've been placed at several different points throughout the system um, so that the individual who's logging this can watch how the air flows and changes to see if there's any issues or obstructions in the system as a whole. 
Now here are just some examples of the different areas that you may consider putting one of these temperature sensors as you're really trying to get that systematic um, systematic view of the, the temperature as it moves through the system. Right here, um, you can see a graph from that specific application. Um, now we had, had used kind of a 3D diagram to demonstrate what it actually looked like because it's hard to get, you know, uh, pictures that are actually showing the interior of the vents where this was deployed. Um, but this was in a building where uh, they had certain temperature zone setbacks where um, throughout the day, as people were in the building, the system controlled that temperature to a fairly narrow range and allowed it to kind of leak out of range um, on days when people were not necessarily scheduled to be there. Um, you'll notice at several points, it kind of ducks way outside of the parameters of where the system is set. Um, by monitoring this, the team was able to upgrade their, their programming such that they could maintain optimal control temperatures throughout the week. Now, it's always best to use a variety of loggers and sensors within their specified operating parameters. As an example, many loggers are not weatherproof. and must be protected from moisture or excess temperature exposure. Others with Bluetooth technology might be ideal for hard to reach or limited access areas within a facility. In some applications, sunlight or other temperature sent sources can potentially influence readings and leave you with erroneous data. External temperature probes are a viable option for getting accurate data um, from a specific or hard to reach place. Temperature sensors are designed for specific conditions, so it's really important that you keep that in mind as some sensors can be damaged if exposed to extreme heat or cold conditions. When measuring surface temperature of a pipe or a similar system, conductivity paste is a must to ensure that you have accurate data. Placing insulation over the sensor would help to be a buffer to ensure that the room temperature conditions don't influence the readings of the sensor itself. All right, so the next application that we're gonna talk about is air quality. In the indoor air quality space, we have numerous options for logging the air quality in an office or other indoor environment. Our most basic offering is likely the UX100003 temp logger. This would be the square looking logger pictured here towards the right. Um, the logger is inexpensive, low profile, and accurate for deployment inside a facility. The next unit, the U12013, is a dedicated temp RH logger with an optional external sensor, which can help you gather more temperature data um, from that external sensor if you know there's an area nearby that you need to reach and get a specific reading from. In recent years, we've moved to integrating Bluetooth technology into our air quality line. Options for temperature, humidity, and CO2 tracking are immensely popular with our customers. The Bluetooth technology greatly simplifies the data offload process and allows you to leave the logger deployed for longer while you're offloading data. Bluetooth um, has really kind of changed the game in a sense um, for how these loggers can be used. If you can really deploy a logger in a vent and get a more or less real-time approximation of what that logger is reading, it gives you a lot more visibility into the system as a whole from the get-go. Additionally, pulling data over a period of time becomes easier since you don't have to actually remove the logger from its deployment in order to collect it. Max, we just have a quick question here. You mentioned real-time access to the, your data with this logger. Could you explain how that works? Do you need to be within a certain amount of feet from the logger? Is it something you can access remotely? Could you just dive into that a little bit more? Yeah, so 
the in a general sense um, the Bluetooth loggers particularly when Bluetooth is is turned on to be broadcasting um, will send out a little notification on the air um, when you use the application and you get within about a hundred feet line of sight that cuts down slightly when it's an event um, you will get that signal that's broadcasting um, the, the exact temperature or the exact reading that the logger is getting at that point. Um, you do, however, need the Hobo mobile application um, in order to pair with and utilize the Bluetooth loggers. So we're going to take a closer look at a CO2 study using the MX1102A CO2 logger. Um, this logger, uh, in comparison to others on the market, is fairly low cost. Um, it'll give you your temperature, relative humidity, as well as CO2 levels. It's perfect for deployment in an office or manufacturing environment, um, and the visual display and audible alarms provide a convenient way to maintain safe working conditions. So this specific diagram uh, shows the result of using carbon monoxide data loggers uh, for a study um, of a commercial office building's parking garage. Now, following installation of the CO2 monitors, the uh, individuals conducting this study were able to determine that there really was a, a heightened CO2 level at points in which people and, and cars were, were most um, actually active in that environment. Um, they were able to do this by, by deploying the loggers in the area and then pulling a data set that looks similar to the following. Now you'll see here um, that at the beginning and end of day, they were, there were pretty massive spikes in the CO levels in the actual facility. Um, once the teams realized this, they were able to update the programs controlling the ventilation uh, such that they remained and continued to be active um, or were more active at the periods when this CO2 was most present. Um, as you can see, once this change was made in their systems, the levels died down significantly. Now, while sensor placement, it's, it's a difficult thing to kind of approach because sensors in general will read um, an approximation of 1,000 to 2,000 square feet, more or less. But factors such as airflow and the layout of a building in general um, can greatly impact uh, the data that you're collecting and skew the data that you're collecting. So it's really important that you take into consideration all of those factors uh, when deploying these air quality monitors for accurate testing. Um, for CO2 studies, um, it's always best to have a sensor in each occupied zone. But as the sensors are accessible, uh, there is a risk you run on people tampering with it. Um, we've, we've dealt with cases where people breathe on the sensor, which, which will significantly skew the rating. Um, so, you know, sometimes we'll recommend putting them in an air duct or an out of reach place in that occupied zone. So this is a, another poll question that is just for your visual entertainment. Uh, we appreciate your patience as uh, we move along to the, the final application, which is lighting. So Onset has a, a couple of different options for logging lighting. They kind of fall into, in a standalone sense, they fall into two buckets. Um, the first is going to be dedicated light on-off loggers, and the second will be light and occupancy loggers. Um, both of these loggers are, are fantastic for determining um, the actual utilization of lighting in a, in a room. Um, and they come for a, a number of different um, spaces and sizes. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, the added value of having a light and occupancy sensor is that you can correlate the data for movement in the room with um, the actual light data in order to get um, better information about how that, that room is being utilized. 
from a remote monitoring sense, um, we have another option for looking at lighting at, at a building or a panel perspective. That would be the EG4100 series. There's a 15 CT version and a 30 CT version. Um, by deploying one of these in a panel, um, you can get real-time access to your data via Wi-Fi or cellular connection. Um, and you can actually see as lights are turned on and off because the, the loads as they're separated in the unit will, you know, flash up and down accordingly. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the light and occupancy loggers, um, the UX90s that we spoke about a few moments ago. Um, they're really well suited for investigating opportunities related to lighting controls and verifying proper controls of systems. Um, you know, rather than logging at regular intervals, which is common with some of our, our loggers in general, these will only log when there's a change in the state value that it's looking at. Um, that conserves, you know, battery to a certain extent, and it gives you better information. Now, the specific application that we're going to be looking at is um, California State University Long Beach, um, who decided that they had some issues with some of their occupancy sensors in the building. They basically had sensors that would turn the lights on when people entered the room and were supposed to turn them off when people were leaving. Um, this is really important for us because in um, California, there, there was an energy study in general that showed that lighting in general typically represents 20 to 50% of total consumption. So they, they are really a great example of the, um, of the optimal use of this. They're in a place where this is a, a large portion of maybe that, that energy usage. And um, it's a great study to look at. So why don't we dive in? So basically the, the University of California uh, took these these loggers and deployed them at several locations in this building where they thought the lighting sensors were being used. You'll notice here um, that the gray area sh supposedly shows where the lights are on and the dark areas show when people were in the room and the lights were on. One thing you'll quickly notice is that all of the data collected is within that gray area. This means that the lights were never turning off in the majority of these rooms that they were deploying the loggers. Um, very quickly, by assessing the specific rooms that were showing these kinds of issues, the teams were able to identify which rooms they needed to update the sensors for and um, able to drastically save on their utility bills. As a note, as a note the specific amount that they saved at the end of that study was about $16,000 per year, or the equivalent of 124 kilowatt hours annually. So some notes on deployment of the light loggers. Um, it's really important to deploy the loggers specifically in or around the lights that you're trying to monitor. Um, to avoid tampering with the loggers, we'll often um, encourage you to put them kind of out of sight um, but nearby the lights themselves. Um, in general, though, um, th there's, no, there's no wrong way to deploy these, but it does make sense in some circumstances to use a specific light pipe, particularly um, when you're dealing with trying to see if a single bulb or a single system is, um, you know, using the mo is being used the most. All right, so um, now we're going to get to the uh, part of the webinar where we had, you know, kind of open the floor for questions. Now, prior to uh, today's discussion, um, some of you were able to submit questions to our team. Um, so we're gonna start out with, with those questions in general, and then we'll open the floor for a couple more from the audience. Um, in, the first question we spoke about kind of briefly in the indoor air quality space, but the question, as you can see, is how many data loggers should be placed in a building to most accurately monitor um, HVAC performance, humidity? 
Um, in a general sense, there, there is no exact answer because of the dynamics of airflow and floor layout, um, but we usually recommend about one logger for every 1,000 to 2,000 square feet. Um, the logger's measurement will generally be accurate within the margin of error for that space, um, but as I mentioned, you need to take into consideration um, airflow patterns that may skew or change this reading. Um, so that you can deploy additional loggers accordingly. In a given space, readings at a readings of a logger at floor level and one at the same spot but at the ceiling will even differ slightly. So it depends on how specific you want your readings to be um, for you to actually determine how many need to be utilized. The second question uh, that, that we brought forward is uh, what are the best practices for calibration? And uh, that really depends on the scope of your work or the project. Uh, minimal drift is going to be expected in both time and accuracy over the course of about a year. Um, annual drift for our temperature loggers is usually plus or minus 0.18 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in terms of time, you're looking at plus or minus one minute per month. Um, that, that minute data, however, will reset when the device is offloaded and the device is reconfigured. Logger is offloaded and the device is reconfigured. Um, the temperature drift, however, can be unavoidable. If you're concerned about the sensor drift for your logger, um, please refer to the actual product manual for that specific logger for calibration instructions and or contact technical support for assistance. The next question we have is, can data loggers be integrated with solutions. So at this point um, you cannot actually integrate any of our standalone loggers with the real-time monitoring platforms. Um, it is important to note though that both of the real-time monitoring solutions that we talked about today um, do have an extensive suite of sensors um, that will encompass all of the parameters that we support from a standalone basis. Um, what makes a sensor revenue grade? So the general rule for revenue grade of a sensor or meter is going to be plus or minus 2% accuracy. Um, some of the loggers we've talked about today fit squarely within that range, others do not. Um, so it's really important that you understand the demands of your client and or the project to determine whether or not a revenue grade sensor will be needed. Last but not least, before we get to some of the crowd questions. Um, we were asked if there's a way to simplify data offload into a JPEG or PDF format. So there is, um, depending on which type of logger you're using, whether that be one of the Bluetooth or one of the USB-based loggers. Um, the USB loggers, um, when you open the file in Hoboware, you can directly print the chart and or graph um, into a PDF document. It's, it'll end up being one of the options on the print section. Um, in the mobile device or in that, that offloads a Bluetooth logger, um, you will actually only have that option if you're directly pushing um, the file from, from the application. Um, you can push the data and graphs together in other formats, but if you're trying to offload everything at once, PDF sits there squarely as, the, as a single option. All right, so without further ado, Taryn, do we have some questions from the crowd? Yes, thank you very much, Max. I do want to address a couple of questions that came up um, and also apologize for a typo on one of our slides. Um, so several of you did ask about the study regarding the CO2 versus a carbon monoxide uh, data logger. So that study was actually on uh, measuring carbon dioxide. And the point of that particular study was actually along the lines of energy savings. Um, what that company had done was installed a new system uh, and they were operating a fan to get the exhaust system going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And by monitoring the CO2 levels, they were able to determine um, from an energy saving standpoint that it would be much more cost effective to only run those fans um, during the higher peaks 
of the day when the CO2 was reaching a certain point. Um, so again, I do apologize for the typo. We don't make a carbon monoxide sensor. Um, we are just monitoring CO2 at this point. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we can always address those for you again later. One of the questions that came in, Max, that we would like you to speak a little bit more about um, is really the benefits of our remote monitoring system, the RX3000. Um, I saw on the slide that you had pointed out we offer a cellular, Wi-Fi, or Ethernet version of that. Could you talk to which one you would recommend and why? Sure. So um, I, I think the best option in terms of connectivity is really going to depend on um, your specific project or application. Um, in most indoor spaces for commercial use, uh, people will opt for the, the Wi-Fi version of the unit. Um, the actual data transmission to the Wi-Fi is not going to be an incredible load over the Wi-Fi system such that it bogs down um, the system itself. Um, and, and it's fairly inexpensive because um, you're, you're already, you know, supporting the Wi-Fi system that's moving the data on an ongoing basis. Um, the cellular system works just as well indoors. Um, the, the reason that you'd see it a little bit less is because, you know, as with any mobile or cellular type of data service, there is a, a small fee associated on an annual basis with um, supporting that plan. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of indoor applications where maybe you don't want to utilize um, a, a client or customer system, their Wi-Fi for moving your data on an ongoing basis. So you may prefer to have that separate connectivity where you're pushing your data up to the cloud on an ongoing basis. In addition to that, if the power goes out, um, in a general sense, um, the cellular plan will allow you to have your data continuously fled, fed to the cloud service. Um, when you have a, a Wi-Fi connection and the power goes out, the data will still log and the RX3000 will still hold that data for upload when the Wi-Fi comes back on, um, but you will lose track of your data and any specific instantaneous alarms that you set up with the system. Um, prior to that. Thank you, Max. Um, so here's a question you would probably be excited to talk about. Uh, so we have a question that just came in about monitoring multiple temperature points throughout a building uh, wirelessly. We do have a couple of options for that. And perhaps you can speak a little bit about what those options would be. Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, you didn't touch upon them in your webinar, but I think now would be a good time to just give a high level introduction to what those options are. Yeah, of course. Um, so we have two main uh, wireless solutions for uh, monitoring temperature or other parameters throughout a building or facility. Um, the first that I'll talk about is a system that's not specifically pictured here, but we'd be happy to send out information regarding it uh, following the webinar if anyone's interested. And we call that our ZW series, um, which is a, a wireless series specifically designed for um, an indoor environment where um, you have a unit that, that connects to a computer, which will be constantly running and managing the data locally. Um, and it, from that unit, you can build a mesh network of wireless sensors throughout a building. Um, those specific sensors will have um, about a 300 foot line of sight connectivity between each node in this mesh network that you're building. Um, but it does allow you to have localized real time alarms um, for the different parameters that you have. Um, you'll see if you take a look, the, the moats are also fairly small. Um, so it's a pretty low profile way to deploy um, this kind of a, a network throughout your building. Um, the, a couple of caveats there are you do need that, that computer on site in order to, um, you know, have the system function properly and the nodes will um, ideally have a, a localized power source, uh, AC or otherwise, that'll, that'll power them on an ongoing basis. The other option that, that we have to offer and it's exciting to talk about is our, our recently released wireless sensor network for the RX3000. Um, now, we spoke a little bit about the ARCS 3000 earlier as our, our main um, like remote monitoring system. Um, there is a recently released module for the ARCS 3000 that allows you to incorporate up to 50 wireless sensors, um, all feeding back data to that device. 
Um, those, those sensors specifically, the reason there might be a benefit for using it is that they can communicate to the device at a much further distance um, than the ZW system I previously mentioned. Um, as of now, um, we are only offering environmental parameters like temperature and humidity um, for this wireless system, but it's definitely a, um, a feasible and powerful solution um, for getting that kind of a temperature profile for a facility. Excellent. Thank you so much, Max. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the difference between using our HoboWare Pro and our free downloadable version of HoboWare. Um, also, if you could touch upon when you may need the Hobo Mobile app instead. If you could just kind of explain those three different platforms, that would be great. Sure. So um, what we'll dig into HoboWare first. Um, HoboWare is the main software for both uh, PC and Mac that supports our um, USB loggers as, as well as our other loggers. We have some um, previous gen analog loggers um, that, that'll integrate with the software as well. Um, the HoboWare application in, in its free form can really apply to something like 75% of applications. Uh, most indoor air quality um, projects and uh, studies can utilize the software to offload their data and properly graph it out. Um, other studies, um, particularly with regard to energy consumption, um, may require HoboWare Pro for the additional assistance that um, enable you to calculate kilowatt hours usage and some of the other um, data that takes in multiple parameters. Um, from a, a practical standpoint, the, the largest difference is going to be that the Pro version, in addition to the um, assistance that I just mentioned, has additional graphing functionality that allows you to kind of display your data in um, a more convenient manner. Um, that being said, uh, both are generally um, functional options for, for the vast majority of projects. Hobo Mobile um, is going to be the free application that supports all of our Bluetooth devices. Um, it's available for free on both the uh, Apple Store and Google Play Marketplace. Great. Thank you, Max. And any benefits to having Hobo Mobile, perhaps free cloud-based data storage? Yes. Uh, we, so this is a feature of uh, Hobo Mobile that sometimes we keep on the down low, but it's, it's definitely good to, to give to um, customers like yourselves that um, utilize our products on an ongoing basis. Hobo Mobile can link up with our system, HoboLink, that's the cloud system uh, that supports our remote monitoring system, the RS3000, um, such that you can utilize your HoboLink account, log into the Hobo Map Mobile app with it, and your data will automatically be backed up in the cloud. Um, particularly when you have a large volume of loggers deployed in an area, um, this makes data collection really easy because you can label each logger specifically for where it's deployed and then go one by one and watch as those data files are organized and labeled in your cloud-based depository. Great. Thank you, Max. Um, one other thing to note with that feature, um, it is a little tidbit of information we don't always share with customers, but it can be really beneficial for a lot of you um, who are doing different types of um, HVAC monitoring or even air, indoor air quality where you are sending someone else out into the field. If they simply have the app on their cell phone, they can easily read out the data for you and it's automatically pushed up to the cloud where you then have access to it. Super simple, super easy, and then you can send out a lot of people to help you collect your data if you don't have the feet on the ground to be able to do that yourself. Um, and as Max said, it's a great place to have a repository of all of your data being collected from different locations. So Max, just another question here for you. Um, we had a couple of people ask about different third-party sensors, for example, an air velocity sensor. If you could just talk a little bit about how our data loggers are able to integrate with third-party sensors, that'd be wonderful. Sure. So um, our loggers, in, in general, can integrate with a variety of third-party sensors. Um, there's a couple things to take into account whenever you're considering utilizing a third-party sensor. The, the first of those is going to be the output 
of the sensor. The second is going to be power or excitation for that sensor. Um, if you're taking, for example, the UX12006M, the four channel, four to 20 milliamp logger, um, any, any third party sensor with a four to 20 milliamp output can be integrated with this device. Um, however, the this specific logger will not have the excitation power um, generally to to power that third party sensor by itself. So it's important um, when you're using a logger like this without that excitation power to ensure that you have a localized power source, um, whether that be some sort of DC battery or arrangement locally um, to power the sensor on an ongoing basis. Um, you do see this application or this this kind of an arrangement with the RX3000 quite often. Um, the RX3000 similarly has an analog module which will take in uh, four to 20 milliamp or voltage outputs. Um, and the RX3000 will actually provide um, excitation power. Um, that being said, it is important um, to once again identify the power requirements of the third party sensor you use to make sure that it can fully integrate with the RX3000. Excellent. Thank you very much, Max. So I will just say we have a lot of wonderful questions coming in here, starting to get a little bit more product specific. Um, so I do want to let those of you know that if we have not answered your question at this time, we will be having someone give you a phone call and then that way they can discuss your questions and give you more tailored answers. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. And again, we will follow up with you to make sure we answer all of your questions. But thank you so much for the questions that have been sent in so far. So um, just so that everyone's aware, here is both my contact information as well as Terrence. Um, you can feel free to reach out to either of us directly with any specific questions that you have. Um, we've also included um, the, the phone number for our technical support team. In case you have a specific question about the logger you're utilizing, um, maybe you, you want to expand upon one of the, the tips you already have or you're trying to make it work in the field, um, they're, they're definitely the ones to go to at that point. If you're considering a new application or looking into a, a new parameter to log, um, you can also feel free to call our general um, application helpline, um, which will be the last line listed there. Um, all of our talented application specialists will be happy to assist you um, with a conversation directed specifically towards your application. In general, thank you all for attending today.